My name is Rashmi Halkar Singh, and I'm the online and social media editor of the Headache Journal. And I'm joined today by the authors of one of our recent case reports called Popping the Balloon, the Abrupt Onset of a Spinal CSF Leak and Spontaneous Intracranial Hyper Hypotension and Idiopathic Intracranial Hypertension. Uh, Drs. Gary Saliotti, Dr. Linda Gray, and Dr. Tim Amrine, and also the corresponding guest editorialist, Dr. Ian Carroll. And we'd like to have a conversation today about both of these manuscripts. So first of all, welcome to all of these authors. And I'd like to begin by asking our authors of the case report to walk us through the case itself. Sure, Gary, do you want to start since you were lead author? Yeah. Yes, I would love to. So the case um, is about this middle-aged woman that had documented neurologic symptoms, these debilitating headaches, and um, kind of tinnitus that she had documented along with papilledema. Um, and one day, essentially, she underwent basically this episode of Valsalva while using the restroom and underwent a Valsalva maneuver and experienced this very acute onset of new neurologic symptoms um, following this Valsalva, Valsalva maneuver, um, subsequent to which she got imaged. And basically, we found uh, a CSF leak, um, which was in the setting of what had presumed to be previously be um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And so the case really raised an interesting question of could the pre existing intracranial hypertension, as documented by, by her papilledema, have contributed to perhaps the onset of the CSF leak, um, the thought being perhaps an acute on chronic elevation of CSF pressure there, but I'm sure we'll discuss that further. But that is that is generally the, uh, the overview of the case and what happened to our patient. So, so what did you all find? Well, I, I can take it from here. So she, uh, she's actually, a, a, of course, like all of these patients, a super nice woman. And she, I think if I have this correct, is a mother of five. And so this poor person was miserable uh, and had really debilitating symptoms. Um, you know, it, she had really clear spontaneous intracranial hypotension based on the brain MRI, even before traveling to Duke. And so, you know, in myelography, uh, we saw a very obvious CSF leak on the left, a T7 coming from the nerve root sleeve. And we uh, figured that out by using dynamic myelography where we kind of layer on our side and put contrast in uh, the intrathecal space and then do, use a tilting table. Um, and so uh, it was really clear what her problem was. Um, but the question was whether or not, uh, you know, it was the underlying high pressure that, that caused the problem. What was of interest is we then proceeded to patch her uh, using CT fluoroscopy guided patching directed right to the site of that leak with blood and fiber and glue. And then she uh, very quickly swung into rebound intracranial hypertension. Um, I think of note also her opening pressure, even with a CSF leak, wasn't it like 27, Gary? It was really high. And so you imagine before she popped That's exactly her balloon, right. Yeah, before she popped her balloon, her pressure was probably much higher. So that's really fascinating. You know, I don't really think, yeah, I was really uh, interested by this case just because there's a relationship between spontaneous intracranial hypotension and idiopathic intracranial hypertension that we don't really think about too often. Or, you know, as a clinician, I don't come across too often in my own patients. What should I think about the next time I see a patient who might have, um, intracranial hypertension, or what can I take from this and apply to the patients I see in my clinical practice? I think, uh, you know, one thing that's really important to think about, right, is that this, as Ian really eloquently wrote in his editorial, could be the first case index study sort of explaining another mechanism of a CSF leak. And so if I was to actually uh, relay to the neurology group, one thing that hopefully is now widely known is that SIH is actually a pretty bad misnomer, right? The hypotension piece is really not accurate, right? And so we, we found that only a third of patients with leaks actually have low pressures less than six. And some pressure, some patients have pressures that are elevated. I mean, this patient had 
a pressure of 27, but Linda, we've seen people in the thirties, right. And even higher. So um, I think that's one broad take home message uh, is that, you know, just because your patient's got a high pressure doesn't mean they don't have a leak. Um, and, you know, high pressures could potentially lead, lead to leaks in certain circumstances. Um, I, I would say, you know, um, some of, you know, I've seen a number of these patients. So it was good that, um, that Tim and Gary, you know, presented it as a case report, but listen, this is not the first person that we've seen that has this problem. And um, I, I have a patient that I saw who had, was on Dymox uh, as a child, okay, since she was five for intracranial hypertension. And her opening pressures at the time were in the 30s. And then they took her off her Dymox. I think she was on both Dymox and Tobamax. They took her off of it. And all of a sudden she developed a he headache of a different character, right? So, um, so she all of a sudden developed a positional headache. She came in to see us. Now her pressure instead of in the 30s was like 12. She had basically ruptured the um, subarachnoid space along the spinal axis through one of the nerve root sleeves. And she had this huge extravasation of contrast. And so again, just like Tim, we patched her and now her pressure is high again. Right. So what was the problem there? The problem was is she had high pressure. They took her off her medication. She blew and now she's in low pressure. So I think it's not you have to always consider like when the character of the headache changes, think about, you know, a high pressure patient blowing out. I even think that some of the ventral leaks that we see where there are discs that have penetrated the dura are potentially high pressure people who, where the, the balloon gets so full, it rubs against like a disc, it may be small, and then it pops the balloon basically. And then you have a big ventral CSF leak. And I've got a couple of patients right now that have very tiny calcified discs. It's like, you're thinking, why would they possibly uh, cause a spinal fluid, fluid leak? And I think it's on the basis of the fact that you know, they had high pressure to begin with, and then you patch them, and then they, they uh, blow against that. Yeah. So to Linda's think, point, the, go ahead, Gary. Oh, sorry. I was just going to jump in and say, to Linda's point, this uh, patient is a perfect example of that because she was just taken off her CSF pressure lowering medication or cetazolamide before she had this incident event that kind of caused this headache of new character to come on and the uh, CSF leak. Yeah, that's, I think that's really fascinating to me because it's not something that we as clinicians really think about too often. We're often thinking about the numbers to help guide us in our clinical practice of, uh, you know, CSF disorders um, and headache. So if we do see a pattern change, I think that would be a good indication for us to reevaluate and uh, think about whether um, a leak might be involved. I think that would, that's a good take home message. Yeah, and some of the patients who actually have high pressure and blow out do not show imaging findings of SIH. So you're not necessarily going to see the sag of the brain. Like I have one patient right now, she's got a big ventral leak and she has no findings of intracranial hypotension or hypovolemia, no dural enhancement, no sagging brain. And why would that be? Because she inherently has high pressure that is kind of keeping her brain afloat. So she's not getting all of the MR manifestations that you might expect to see. But she's so, got a ventral leak. So how do you make the diagnosis of a leak in that situation? You could start with an MR scan of the spine oh, and yeah. see if there is a, you know, some kind of fluid collection. You could start with that. So yeah. I, I, I would just point out that uh, from a study that we did it over 90% over of patients with a leak have a positive brain MRI. So that would be the first place I would start. But Linda's point is well taken, right? You know, you can have 8% or less of patients with a leak where their brain MRI is negative. So if you have a high index of clinical suspicion, you should proceed with LP and myelography or some other imaging exam of the spine. But, but yeah, I, I, you know, this lady, this lady, despite a high pressure, had a positive brain MRI. So if you have a change in the character of the headache, that'd be the first place I'd go. And if you're still worried, move on to the spine stuff. So, so always think about the basics, you know, change, pattern change, think about imaging. I think that's a good, good point. Um, question for Dr. Carroll, you know, in your editorial, you mentioned that there are some new treatments on the horizon. Can you explain some of those to us? So um, what the editorial talked about a little bit is 
uh, the authors, I think, present a compelling case of uh, IIH preceding uh, the leak. And I think that is a, a major step towards um, proving what their underlying hypothesis is, which is tonic elevations of intracranial pressure actually cause leaks. Uh, but really, to, to establish causation, you want to show that changing the uh, predisposing factor changes the outcome. And uh, we just point out that there are ongoing trials of new agents uh, to target IIH. And it would be interesting to look at the outcome of those trials as a secondary endpoint to look at, does it reduce the likelihood of reverting to an SIH picture? I.e., do people treated for IIH develop not just reduced rates of um, headache or vision loss, do they show reduced rates of developing uh, spontaneous CSF leaks? And uh, there's at least two trials that I know of um, for agents that I know of that are undergoing uh, clinical trials for that. One is the IIH pressure trial, uh, which is looking at exenatide, which is a, a GLP-1 agonist, a glucagon-like uh, peptide-1 agonist that both causes uh, better glucose control, it causes weight loss, but in animal studies, independent of weight loss, reduces the production of CSF and reduces CSF pressure in animal models. Um, and so this is an ongoing randomized controlled uh, placebo controlled trial. And um, it'd be interesting to see if as we start to have agents that reduce intracranial pressure, do they reduce secondary outcomes like this uh, which would open the door to not just recognizing this as a risk factor for developing a leak, but a modifiable risk factor, which would segregate it, really make it a more actionable risk factor than having a hereditary disorder of connective tissue, which we understand to be a predisposing risk factor, but it's one you can't, you can't really do much about. And so um, I think that then opens up the the potential avenue for the way we talk about prophylaxis for heart attacks, primary prophylaxis to prevent your first problem and secondary prophylaxis for when somebody's already had the problem and you've treated them for it, i.e. somebody had a leak, you've treated them for it. As Dr. Gray talked about, they start presenting signs of intracranial hypertension again. You have this as a effective, uh, potentially effective, um, agent for secondary prophylaxis of having a leak recur. I think that all sounds really exciting and offers hope to a lot of people who seem to be stuck at the moment with their problems of, you know, these CSF disorders. So that, that's great. Um, anyone else have any other comments that they want to add? I guess just because I, I, I don't want to let the pitch fly by. Um, the, uh, the neuroradiologists at Duke run a world-class, world-renowned CSF leak program, but there is controversy among uh, experts about what would the right gold standard be to assess in a rigorous way the sensitivity of MRI of the brain. And since it's hard to really know what non-imaging gold standard you should use to test your imaging against, there are people, and I'm one of them, that are skeptical that the sensitivity of a positive brain MRI, and emerging literature in the last two years has really raised the question of what constitutes a positive brain MRI. But letting that go, um, there are people, and I'm one of them, that are very skeptical that their underlying sensitivity of brain MRI for CSF leak is 90%. But that number is published, and People, uh, people talk about it. And I think that's a, a, good, a good subject for an open debate in another forum. <laughs> well, I guess that my only other pitch is I would like drug companies uh, to start working on better agents for reducing CSF pressure. I think it's a huge problem. And I just don't think there are enough tools out there in our toolbox in order to address it. So I'm glad to hear that somebody's working on some other agent because really what we've got right now is just not adequate. The, uh, that IIH pressure trial, it's looking at exenatide first in a first phase. And then when that phase closes, it's actually then looking at comparatively 
the relative benefit of acetazolamide, amylaride, spironolactone, furosemide, and topiramate, the kind of typical things we've all been using. And then there's this other target that's been identified. Um, Allison Sinclair talks about it a little bit, 11-beta-hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase. And so there's, there are trials coming down that are going to give us a better sense of what's really best among the typical agents we've been using and what are going to be new classes of agents that might really just take it to a whole new level. Because if, um, as the authors have pointed out, uh, if this is really an underlying mechanism of SIH, it calls for rigorous data on what, what we can do about this. Yeah, I think that's right. It's all really well said. You know, th there, are, there are three subtypes of CSF leak, and this one's one of the nerve root sleeve diverticular tears. But uh, the subtype that I think is of greatest interest to me in the high pressure scenario is actually the fistulas, the CSF divinus fistulas. Because um, it, it seems like if you just think about our expected understanding of that pathophysiology, that high CSF pressure could predispose you to developing fistulas. And we've seen many cases where we've had successful treatment of fistulas, either through surgery or now venous embolization with onyx that then lead to a subsequent fistula at a different level or a different location. Uh, and so I think this is sort of early food for thought as we kind of go down this path. Is it high pressure that's causing some of these fistulas? or at least in some capacity. Tim, can I step in in, as, in the role of a moderator for a second, just because some of the headache neurologists may not be as familiar with you as CSF, in CSF venous fistulas, and just talk about how our understanding of that has changed over the last three years and what they are and, and why we're all paying more attention to them now? Yeah, I'll start. And then, you know, there are other experts here. So you guys jump in and, and fill in. But, uh, you know, actually before, I think it was 2014 in a, in a paper published by Wouter Shevink and the Cedar sinai group, we didn't know that fistulas existed. And so um, initially in some of their initial work, they uh, reported that it was something like one to 3% of patients with SIH had an underlying CSF to venous fistula, but it was about 29% of patients were uncategorized. Turns out, probably all of those are fistulas. And we, we're finding, I would say, at Duke, it seems like 30 to 40% of our patients with SIH actually have underlying fistulas. Exactly why they happen, uh, we're not sure about. They occur more commonly in the thoracic spine. Um, and there are arachnoid granulations that live in the thoracic spine as well, or throughout the spine, really, but most commonly in the thoracic spine. And so some postulate that that's the underlying mechanism is that you blow out an arachnoid granulation, which leads to a pathologic uh, connection between the CSF containing nerve root sleeve and an adjacent paraspinal vein. And that leads to just this unregulated egress of CSF back into the bloodstream and CSF hypovolemia. So that's the concept behind it. So you can imagine how uh, you know, CSF pressure could really fit pretty intimately with, with that underlying pathophysiologic mechanism. Tim, if I'm, if I'm worried about a patient with a leak and I, I get my MRI brain and spine, can I rule out that fistula as a cause? No, in fact, you, that's a great question because you can't see the fistulas on any of that imaging. Um, you, you really need dedicated myelography, usually, usually in the form of either digital subtraction myelography or CT myelography. Um, and there are some unique modifications to those imaging modalities that increase the sensitivity, but still don't bring it to 100%. They're hard to find, they're subtle. They're, they're these you know, sub-millimeter little structures. So, so it's certainly not on an MR alone. And will a standard CT myelogram show that kind of thing? It can, but, uh, but you know, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. It's really important to get sub-millimeter images, uh, really thin cuts, because these fistulas, what we see a lot from outside institutions when patients come in with SIH to Duke is they'll get the standard 2.5 five uh, millimeter cuts, and we won't be able to see the fistula on that. So we've got to get really tiny, thin section cuts. And also decubitus imaging ipsilateral to the side of the fistula is really critical. You need really dense contrast. So there's a couple modifications that, that we'll need to do. Excellent. Thanks. Well, thank you all for joining us. This has been great education, and I, I really appreciate your time. And thank you so much for publishing this case report and the editorial as well. It's, it's outstanding. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity everybody. to talk about it. Yeah, nice thank to you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>